Hello and welcome to Scott Tilly Photography and this week's vlog. Uh, it's a bit unusual this this week. Um, I don't know if you've been if you've been following my vlogs previously, you'll probably see that there's been a slightly larger gap this time between vlogs. Normally it's about a week, but it's more like two weeks this week, and that's simply because I've tried to um, get this one done once before and failed due to unacceptable noise I think on the audio. Um, I tried to video this one in my own back garden. I live at Carlton on Trent and we're about 200 meters from the A1 and we get used to it living living there but listening back to the audio when I recorded it um, it was absolutely awful and I didn't really want to subject anybody to listen to that for about 15-20 minutes so I decided I was going to move it somewhere else. Now I'm known on YouTube for my landscape photography what some people may not know is that from about 2005 until 2015 I shot probably 80% wildlife photography so I've got a really big background in wildlife photography now I'd always wanted to do vlogs on wildlife photography but I don't consider them very easy to film generally with a landscape vlog you can go to a location and even if the weather that you know you've done all your planning and the weather's not as as expected you can change your techniques to come back with a good image and you can use that in your vlog what the danger with doing wildlife photography vlogs in my opinion is you can do all that planning and then the animal doesn't turn up so you've done an awful lot of work and you've come back with nothing so I've always sort of slightly avoided it but wanted to do it. Now looking back at my wildlife images from 2005, I thought if I'm going to do this, probably the best way to do it is to start how I started. And the reason for that is because when I first started, I didn't have expensive kit. I wanted to do wildlife photography. So the best way to start is actually to photograph the birds in your garden. Now. Obviously I'm not in my garden today, I'm in a local wood woodland, that's simply because of the noise levels from the A1, but the principles I'm going to teach you here are exactly the same as you'd use in your garden, so please stick with it. And what the other th important factor to consider is these techniques, a lot of them are transferable when you start doing other wildlife photography, so the, the th processes, the thought processes that you'll go through are exactly the same for a lot of other wildlife so it's important as I say and I thought to start with this one because you can control because it's your back garden you can control a lot of the elements and that enables you to almost guarantee you'll get fantastic images right the first thing that you're going to need to consider when you're setting up um, a feeding station so that you can take images of birds in your garden is where to set up your feeders what feeders to use whether to use a bird table now in my experience obviously this is just an example but I've set this feeder up here in the woodland because the Sun is coming from that direction and it's going to move around here so that's one of the first considerations is obviously you want to, to place the feeders so that it's advantageous for your perches. Obviously what you're not doing, you're not taking pictures of birds on the feeder, that's what we want to get away from. So what I'm trying to do here, I place this feeder here, the sun's coming from that direction, now I want to put a perch in here somewhere, so that the birds will land on the perch here before going onto the feeder, the sun's coming from that direction and it'll swing behind me there, so the, the light on the bird is going to be from the front. Um, and that's what I want so when I talked about everything being controllable it starts here where you place your table or your feeders now again with a table I'd have it in exactly the same position I'd probably hang the feeder from the table one of the other things to consider is you obviously sometimes in gardens you see multiple feeders you know say five ten feeders on these poles if you think about it every one of those feeders that's hanging there provides two or more perches for the birds. Now in when you're photographing birds what you're wanting to do is you want them to go on your perch. So if you've got five feeders with four perches on each that's a hell of a lot of perches for the birds to stand on before they'll stand on your perch that you've put there that's you know a nice attractive colour or whatever. So 
what I would recommend is if you've got a table, you know, don't uh, just have one feeder on it and limit the number of perches so that because what happens is birds are territorial and you've probably seen this a lot actually with robins if you get a robin on a bird table it will boss everything else off so then you'll get birds hanging around the waiting for the robin to disappear so that they can hop on the table which is exactly what you want because then you want that bird to land on your perch but not on the feeder okay so limit the number of feeders i think um and as I say, position it so the sun's in the right position for you. And also look out for any obstructions that are going to cast a shadow across the feeders when you're, you're actually out for taking images. From observation, I mean, what I would tend to do is I would tend to put a table and feeders up probably a week, two weeks before I start taking any photographs. And then I can see at what times of the day the birds are feeding most. Because they do sort of come in waves. Uh, you know, you might get a burst of activity mid-morning, then it drops off over lunch, and then there's another burst in the sort of early to late afternoon. So you want to be photographing then. Now you can look at your at your setup and where you want to put your perches, and you can decide then: is that quite in the right place? Do I need to move it a little bit? Rather than do all this prep, think it's okay, get it out into your hide or whatever you're using for a hide and then find that you've got a nasty great shadow right across where your perch is. So, right, one of the most important issues that we can address here is we know where the feeder is and we've got an idea where we want to put our perches. One of the things that I always consider is what's behind the perch. Now, we'll talk about equipment later, but obviously the depth of field of your lens is going to depend how much of the background is in focus. So if you've got a lens, you know, if say you've got a 500mm Canon lens that goes down to f2.8 and costs, and costs you 10 grand, that's all well and good. You could probably get away with something probably two or three feet behind and you'll still get a nice blurred background. But my reason for doing this vlog on wildlife first is because I started with very basic kit. So your 300mm lens might have um, maximum aperture at 300mm of f6.3 which means there's going to be more of the background in focus now again talking about control this is all stuff that you can look at before you even put your perch in because all you need to do is get your camera out go to where you're going to put your hide or where your hide is is all ready if you've got a, you know something else that you're going to use as a hide and we'll look at that later set your camera up look through at the feeder and then look what's behind it and where your perch is going to be so focus on the feeder take a couple of shots and see what's in focus behind it right something that you do have to consider is the perches that you're going to have to use now for me when i'm doing uh, bird photography in my back garden every time i go out for a, a walk with the dog i'm always on the lookout for the the attractive perches that you know have got a nice texture or texture or nice color and you know this is a prime example you know it's, it's only a twig that's come off one of the trees but it's covered in this lovely green moss now that's a natural perch that a bird might land on and it also complements the plumage of a lot of birds things like blue tits and great tits have got a similar sort of color into them so you know a picture of a, a blue tit on that or whatever would look really nice now the way you sort of get your perches into position depends you know it's a bit Heath Robinson the way you set it up I tend to have a post something like an old broom handle that I've I've sunk into the ground you know, straight up and then I'll basically just gaffer tape things like this on and, and just change them you know every time I've had enough of one type of perch and I find a different one I'll just gaffer tape a new one in you know it's like a crossbar across so that I can position it exactly the the angle that I want you know in relation to the where the sun's coming from where the feeder is and uh, yeah the birds will land on it you get your images and then when you've had enough of that one you can swap it for a different type maybe you've seen some other types of birds come into the feeder and you know this perch doesn't really work for them so you can switch to something else but yeah that's basically the way that I would do it and this this perch actually this one up. I'm, <laughs> I'm taking this one home with me I just found this and you know for me that will look absolutely gorgeous with a bird perched on here now obviously i'm either going to have to shoot that off a log on the ground 
and shoot a little bit lower down. But again, the, the thing with these sort of things is, is, is it's your ing ingenuity to set it up to get the birds to land on there. You know, what I've done with things like this before, probably a bit bigger, a bit wider stumps, is that, you know, there's often a hollow in the middle or you can hollow out the middle and you can put some peanuts or something in there. And if you get things like nut hatches on your garden, they'll land on here, take a nut out of here and then fly off. So, you know, anything really, anything you see like this, as I say, this one's coming back on me because I, re I really like it, I'm going to use it on my own garden. So, yeah, just when you're out in the countryside, find these things, pick them up, take them home and use them. Right, hides. Now, I know this is going to be a bit of a sticking point, or people think it is, because this is a purpose-built hide. It probably costs about 180 quid. Uh, this one's really old actually. I'm pretty sure when I bought it, it was more green and it seems to have turned mainly brown. Um, so it's gone from a, a summer hide to an autumn hide, I think, on its own. Um, it's faded. But yeah, these are about 180, 200 quid, I think. It's just a seat inside that you can sit in and there's various holes uh, you can use to put your camera lens through. Now, people think I've got to have a hide 200 quid this is supposed to be you know budget wildlife photography taking pictures of garden birds I just can't afford it well you can actually I'm not going to throw it but you can do away with that I use this because I've got it but that's not always been the case in your own back garden you have numerous things that sit there all year and potentially can be a hide I'm thinking of things like uh, when my daughter was younger she had a wooden Wendy house that was only about this, this high but it had got a little door she could go through and there was a little window at the side. Obviously she's grown up now and um, when she'd stopped using it I basically used to use that as a hide. The, there was a little perspex window um, and I slid that to one side and I'd have my lens coming through the, the, you know, the window at the side and because that had stood there for five, ten years the birds were used to it anyway so you know you've got an advantage of anything like this that you put in your garden that's new the birds are going to take time to get used to it anyway so that being there gave me an advantage straight away there's other things if you've got an old garden shed an old potting shed you can do the same with that you can adapt that into a hide even things like kids trampolines you know the little eight foot trampolines that they get now once the kids aren't using them, or even if the kids are using them, while they're not using them, you can prop one side up with a couple of breeze blocks, put some scrim netting around the front or an old ground sheet, and make that into a makeshift hide. Again, that's there all the time, so the birds are used to it. A hide is just something to, to conceal you, so, you know, get away from this idea of having to have one of these. Yeah, these are great, and, you know, obviously in a woodland, I can bring this somewhere and use it straight away, but in your own back garden you know use a bit of ingenuity see what you've got yourself old tents that you're not using anymore put that up in the garden for a couple of weeks and then use that as a hide the birds will have got used to it so yeah hides not a worry really it's not going to be a big issue as I say this is just a, a purpose built one um, but you don't have to have it far from it in a, in a garden situation right one of the questions I get asked a lot with regard to wildlife photography is how expensive the kit is and it can be it can be as ridiculously expensive as you want it to be but here we're talking about starting out and the images that I've shown you throughout this vlog of most of them I've chosen because they've been taken on a basic setup most of them are quite old because they were taken in 2005 6 7 8 when I was using really basic kit and again, I'm actually videoing this on a Canon 70D, which I've just bought off eBay for 260 quid. And I would quite, I'm, in fact, I am gonna do, when I do my wildlife these days, that's what I'm gonna do it on, because I absolutely love that camera. I took some of my best wildlife shots on a 70D. And it's quite an old camera now. You know, there's an 80D and a 90D, so it does show you is there anything else? I don't know now, I lost count uh, when I moved over to Sony, but I actually, I think I was more excited a couple of weeks ago when I got this 70D than I was when I got my Sony, simply because it was like welcoming an old friend back and I'd not done any wildlife for a while and it just feels so good in your hands and 
yeah, I've had got such good memories of using that in the past. So don't think camera wise. The point of that is you, you don't need a new top of the range camera. How I like to put it is if you start on basic kit and you do all the other stuff that you need for wildlife, like you learn your field craft, you learn about the animals, you know, you, you try and get rid of all the variables and you shoot images on that basic kit and you'll get cracking results. Trust me, you will, you'll get cracking results. The only thing that will happen if you step up to more expensive kit is you'll get a higher hit rate and it'll make it easier for you. So for instance, I know the 70D is probably something like it shoots at maximum something like six or seven frames a second, I'm not quite sure. So say I'm up in Scotland taking pictures of sea eagles, uh, coming in and taking a fish off the water or whatever. When I do that burst, I've got six or seven frames that it'll go ch -ch 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 -ch. Now if I get a Canon, I don't know, 90D, one of the new ones that's come out, that'll probably shoot at 10 frames per second or more, I don't know. So what that, all that means is that I've got those few more chances to get that shot of that bird in that exact position I wanted it. So it makes your life easier. It doesn't, you know, is it the, the paying that extra money helps, but it's, that's not to say that you can't get wonderful images on more basic kit. That's what I'm trying to say. So don't worry about your camera. Lens-wise, now again, for, for birds in your garden, you can get away on a crop sensor camera, which you know most of the starter cameras are. If you don't know what a crop sensor is, all that really means is that on, on something like this Sony, which is an A7 Mark II, it's got what they call a full frame sensor. So what that means is, and I know I'm gonna get comments in the, the comments below about, oh, it just crops the image, blah, blah, blah. It, this, yeah, we're not gonna get into the technicals of that. As far as you're concerned, on a, on a A7 Mark II, it's a full frame sensor, so when you put something like this 400mm lens on it, it is a 400mm lens. If you've got a crop sensor, which the 770D up there is, the Canon, that's a crop sensor, which means that you multiply the lens by 1.5. So, so a, 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 a 300mm lens would be a 450mm lens, in effect. Now, as I say, I'm not going to worry, I know we'll get comments for that, but I'm not going to particularly worry about that. As far as a beginner's concerned, that's what it does. It moves you closer to the subject, really. Okay, and image quality-wise, there's some some payoff there, but for shooting and shoot and printing off A4 or A3, you will be fine with something like a 70D and a 300mm lens. 300mm lenses, you'll find that's the price point where your sort of kit, 300mm lenses you can get for a couple of hundred quid so a 73 something like a 7300 zoom lens you'll get for under a couple of hundred quid again which is quite affordable for starting in wildlife and that's the sort of thing you want to look at after you've been doing it a while if you enjoy it and you think yeah I really enjoy the wildlife side I really want to invest some more money in kit you can start looking at you know things like prime 300mm lenses or some of the third parties like this Sigma 100-400 uh, which is what I use is probably about five or six hundred quid. I'm not sure how much I paid for it, it must have been something like that second hand I paid for it. But you know it's got image stabilisation on it, um, it's a cracking little lens and on a crop sensor you know that'll give me a, a 600mm lens so you know for a starting point a kit type 7300 lens is ideal for shooting garden birds you don't need to spend a fortune and if you're just trying it out that's all you need if you really enjoy it then you can start looking at upgrading your kit but you know 300 mil kit lens is going to be fine right one or two other tips that you can use with regard to uh, the feeders and garden bird photography because when you put a hide in your garden or when you're using whatever hide you're using in your garden and the birds are used to it that's fine but when you go out to the hide something changes and that is that your lens is sticking out through the hide and again it's something unusual that the birds aren't used to so what you can do is if you look at the size of the, your lens with the lens hood on and then you, you, what you can do is find a, a black plant pot, which is the same size as the end of your lens, and a black uh, and a plastic bottle, something like a plastic bottle, 
cut the end out of the plant pot, the bottom out, and then shove the plastic bottle through, paint it all black, and then you can actually prop that through the hole of your hide, either you know, fasten it to a stick or, or something like that and stick it into the ground so that that stays there sticking out of your hide, whatever the hide is, at all times. And again, the birds are then used to that, so all you do is when you go out to your hide is you just take that out and then put your camera through doesn't phase the birds because they're used to seeing that there. Something else that I learned a while ago is what people say, and I don't know how true this is, but I do use it, much to my wife's annoyance, is that if I'm going out to the hide, I ask her if she'll walk out with me. And then when I go out to the hide, I get into the hide and then she walks back into the house. Apparently this is because birds can't count, so they see somebody come out to the hide and then they see somebody go into the house and then they assume that they've gone. So again, that's something else you can try. When I said earlier that these techniques are transferable to other situations, I have a really good example of this. And I'm gonna put this photo up now as I'm still speaking. Now this image was taken in a woodland actually behind my house. I got permission after I'd done after I'd done some work in the in the garden with garden birds, I wanted to see if I could sort of expand and get a few more different species. So we've got a little wood behind the house, about 200 metres away, and I asked the landowner if it was okay if I put a feeder up in there. So I did, I put a peanut feeder up in there, and every day I used to, what I did is I, in the wood, I, I created sort I didn't want to leave my hide there because I'd got the hide you've seen, I'd got that then, but I didn't want to leave it there because it's quite close to the A1. And again, I didn't want any kit going missing. So what I did is I made my own sort of semi hide in the, in the uh, it, amongst the trees, something that was big enough that I could, when I was out there taking images, I could put the hide inside it and then put that up and sit in the seat but there was already a structure over it, if you like, that the birds had got used to. So I did that, and then I used to go out and look and see what was coming to the feeders, and I noticed I'd got a um, great spotted woodpecker coming to the feeder. And I thought, oh, I'd love to get an image of that, but I didn't want it on the feeder. Anyway, I had a walk through this wood, and I found an old stump, and it was a grey stump, as you can see from this image. And... Uh, it had got all the lines where the beetles had been under the bark, all the bark had come off it. It was an ancient thing. I thought I'd love to get it on there, I'd love to get that woodpecker on there. So what I did is I, like I showed you earlier, I set that stump up next to the feeder. And the woodpecker kept coming back and it kept landing on the feeder. And I thought, and how do I get it on that log? So what I ended up doing, I took my um, cordless drill across uh, to this little wood and I drilled about 30 holes into the side of this um, log on the side so that you, the, you couldn't see it from the camera angle and I drilled them at a slight angle down and then what I did is I basically uh, drilled a hole about two inches deep did about 30 of those and then I posted peanuts in all the holes uh, I filled them all up and then got in the hide and sure enough the the woodpeckers saw these nuts in there and because that's their natural they like to stick to the side of trees it thought it was great and it would stand it would sit there trying to hammer these peanuts out of these holes and it'd get the get the peanuts out and i'd have to refresh them every day but that's how i got this shot so again you can transfer these these techniques and it gets you thinking about how when you know the 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 behavior of the animal then you can you can start developing these techniques that you learn from your garden birds into other situations so that that's really all i wanted to say on that you know this this moves you on to the next level if you like and finally i think what i'd also say is when you're feeding your birds in your garden think about and again it's the same with all wildlife the the welfare of the wildlife always comes first so you should never do anything that's going to you know change the behavior or cause injury to the animals that you're trying to take images of so with garden birds that obviously they over a period of time if you're putting food out and especially when they take most food which is in the winter autumn and winter um, that it can become a, a, a supply that they begin to rely on so i would urge you even if you're not taking images to keep feeding your birds after you've finished taking images you can take your perches down but yes just please keep those feeders going at least throughout the winter until springtime comes 
and then obviously they can start finding more of their own food but you're not you know you're not going to be removing that source of food suddenly which is going to cause them a problem in probably the worst weather right i think that's me done for this week i hope you've enjoyed this vlog i know it's been a little bit different to the ones I normally do anyway that's all i've got to say this week i hope you've enjoyed it please like the video if you have and if you've not subscribed to the channel please subscribe and i shall see you next week i'm not sure what i'm doing next week to be fair i might be up in the northeast again uh, i've got a feeling yeah i think there's been a <laughs> there's been a change of plan my daughter is home from uni, but she's got to go back up for one day. So I've had to book the day off. Uh, but the problem is, it's my wife's Christmas party. So I have got Luna, the dog, who can't be let off the lead. So I'm going to try and do a vlog somewhere in the northeast with the dog on the lead, vlogging camera and stills camera. What can possibly go wrong? <laughs> So I shall see you for that. Uh, thanks for watching, as I say, um, and I'll see you next week. Bye.